Welcome everyone to Fridays at the Studio. We're so happy that you could join us this evening. I'm Kathleen Kelly, the Artistic Director of Action Theatre Conservatory, also known as ATC Studios. For those of you who do not know, ATC Studios is a 501c3 and we have been around for almost 32 years now. And during the COVID crisis, uh, we kept things going for the creative community. We had previously done evenings like this live for playwrights so that they could get feedback from audiences and from actors. Now we have moved that totally to Zoom. And we are so excited because we're able to have people come from literally all around the world. And to keep up to date with what we are offering, please join our mailing list. And the easiest way to do that is to go to the website, atcstudios.org, and go to the About Us tab and pull down to mailing list. Just fill that out and we'll be happy to add you to our weekly newsletter where you will be kept up to date with all of our programming, whether free or classes. As I mentioned, ATC is a 501c3 and COVID times have been tough. These evenings are always free, but we of course accept donations so gratefully. And I hope that you will find it in your heart to donate something tonight. The fastest way of doing that is to go to Venmo at ATC Studios. We also have a donate button on our website. You will, can also donate during, from our Facebook page, uh, which is slash ATC Studios. We also have a GoFundMe campaign. There's so many different ways. And if you would like a receipt for your tax purposes, please just email us and we'll be happy to provide that for you. I am going to introduce Marin. So Marin, take it away. Thank you very much, Kathleen. I'm very delighted to be uh, the director of this wonderful play. Um, and of course, first, it's the, here is Kerr Lockhart. Um, do you want to say anything, Kerr? No, I, I, I hope the play will say what I need to say. <laughs> wonderful. All right. Thank you so much for the yes. opportunity to work on the piece. And just thanks for all of you for coming. That's like, that's what I should say first and foremost. Thanks everybody for being here. Awesome. All right, thank you. So at first I'm going to introduce my cast um, and I will say their name, they'll come on and they'll, they'll, they'll give you the info. So first I'd like to introduce Susan. Hi, I'm Susan Jane McDonald and I'm reading the role of Eileen Kinsella. And next we have Alicia. Hello, I am Alicia Wavers and I am reading the roles of Judge Moses, Reverend Mother and Sister Catherine. And next we have uh, Tara Haight. Hello there, I'm Tara Haight. I'm playing Morgan, Helena and Dr. Florian. And next we have Millie. Hi, I'm Millie. I'm playing the role of Lisa, Sister Ursula, and Rita. Cool. And we have Robert. Uh, I'm Robert. <laughs> I'm reading the roles of Joseph, Seth, and Willem. And Darren. Hey, hi, hello. I'm Darren Frank Earl II. I'm reading for Bruce, Brock, Kevin, Father David, and Gordon. That is our cast for this evening. Um, I will be, and and now we will just go right on ahead and get to the play. Enjoy, my friends. Sanctity, a play by Kerr Lockhart. 1997, the stage of a university auditorium. A middle-aged man in a dark suit enters briskly and stands at the podium center stage. Good afternoon, Madam Chancellor, Mr. President, fellow deans, faculty and students. I am Joseph Peters, Dean of the Faculty of this Law School. As many of you, if not most know, uh, ordinarily on such occasions, I have the privilege to preside over a celebration when we offer to confer an honorary degree on a distinguished professional. Uh, what follows ordinarily is an acceptance, plans for a formal address at commencement, as well as this informal forum with a reception to follow. Never before in the history of this law school has this honor been declined. 
And while neither the university nor the law school uh, have any wish to uh, question or minimize that choice, we asked the intended honoree uh, if they would address the school to explain their decision in hope that such an exegesis could in itself be instructive. Uh, I am very gratified that that second invitation was accepted. Uh, you students have read in the matter of Kinsella in your professional responsibility courses. Uh, law schools have been teaching it for the better part of two decades. Uh, but it is important to remember the real world stakes and real life uh, people affected by these cases, which are mere names to us. Uh, Miranda, Escobar, Loving, Gideon, even Roe were real people with real problems who suffered real harm. As you know, uh, the lawyer in this case was faced both with criminal charges and with potential disbarment, threatening both her freedom and her livelihood. Uh, I could testify as to how difficult this was in the Kinsella case, but a superior witness is here. Colleagues, students, guests, friends, visitors, Ms. Eileen Kinsella. Eileen joins Joseph at the podium to thunderous applause. <laughs> oh, everyone, sit down, please. Thank you, Father Joseph. Uh, uh, Dean Peters will do for our present purposes, or, or just Joseph. Thank you for coming. Uh, Ms. Kinsella's address will be followed by a Q&A session with me. Uh, if you haven't done so already, please pass your written questions up to the front as soon as possible. Uh, and now, Eileen, uh, the stage is yours. Thank you, Dean Peters. <laughs> well, how do I look? Do I look like a landmark case? They tell us, or at least they told me, you must never meet your heroes. Does my appearance tend to confirm that advice? <laughs> the fact is, I'm an ordinary lawyer with an ordinary practice. And believe me, that is a very fine thing in and of itself to which to aspire. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a priest and had no interest whatsoever in being a nun. So that was the first big career disappointment. <laughs> I got good grades in high school, not because I'm a genius, but because I was raised to work hard. There was no money for college, so I didn't get a fine Jesuit law school education like you're getting here. I went to our beloved state university. Ra, ra, whatever our mascot is. <laughs> I suppose if I had been trained by Jesuits, it might have steered me better through all my moral and ethical tribulations. At least, even if I made the same choices, I'd be able to rationalize them to a fairly well. Right, Father? I mean, Dean Peters. <laughs> now, you're thinking I'm going to be rambling like this all afternoon. I'll get to the point. Why am I turning down the honorary degree you so graciously offered? Is it because I am modest and self-deprecating? No, <laughs> I am really a monster of ego or I couldn't have done what I did? Is it because what I did wasn't important? No, it was important, crucial. Is it because it was an easy choice? No, the fact is I had no choice. I am no hero. I did what I had to do and I was not at all pleased about it. Here I stand, I can do no other, so help me God if it's not rude to quote Martin Luther in these environs. <laughs> and perhaps if you could lay out the facts before we get to the controversy. Ah, yes, law school. Start with the fact pattern, fine. It begins like so many other cases begin with a phone call and a person in need. Judge Moses is on her phone in chambers. He says you're his lawyer. He says you've represented him before. The person in need was me. I was dead broke. Name is Seth Shodden. 
Oh, God, Seth. No, not in a criminal matter. I haven't represented him. Hmm, said it was something about his mother's house? An entailment. Oh, he was a pain in the ass. Is there anybody else? He insists he wants you. I don't mean to be crass, Eileen, but there's a chance to make some serious money here. What do you mean? It's death eligible. What? You can build a state at $175 an hour instead of the usual $2250. You can hire an investigator too. I... They're processing him now. He'll be available in about an hour. Arraignment is tomorrow morning. Four. Kidnapping, rape, and murder. I, I've never even tried a class A felony. He asks for you especially. Please, Eileen. A TV actress in full 80s regalia appears. Big hair, bright colored blazer, platform shoes. What's exciting about turning your story into a network movie for television, Eileen, is the opportunity for young girls to see a female role model who upholds our ideals as women, who bases her decisions on principle, who can't be bought or sold. Not only could I be bought, but bought cheap. One seventy-five an hour. What about the victim? Sympathetic? A beautiful college girl. Uh, I was hoping for a disgusting drug dealer. So if I agree to go camping with you again this weekend, can we visit the Botanical Gardens next Sunday? Promise. Okay. So why, if you want to wake up on a cold morning lying on the ground, I have no idea, but have to start fire. And just for a little coffee is beyond me. Why I come with you is even more mysterious. Because you love me. <laughs> no comments. Because I can get superior weed. Warmer. Eileen enters a room where Seth is cuff cuffed to a table. Seth. It's Eileen Kinsella. This is Kinsella. How are you, Seth? Are they treating you all right? Oh, great. I always say the cops in Prescott County are the best cops anywhere. You don't have to be Sergeant Joe Friday to arrest a blood-soaked man, a blood-soaked man standing over a dead body. Here's how it happened. Stop. Don't say anything. First, we need to confirm that you're hiring me to be your lawyer. I need you to sign this. Public defender, I don't want some public defender. Seth, I'm an associate public defender. I'm not on staff, but I take the cases they give me and that's what your case is, an assignment from the PD. If I sign this, they could put any lawyer on my case. They could assign Dan Baer. He's a terrible lawyer. <laughs> Considering that you punched a cop in front of witnesses, Dan did a great job getting you six months probation back in 75. At least he's done major criminal work before. I, I just helped you with an estate problem. You're Catholic, aren't you? Does that matter? You're not allowed to believe in the death penalty. What I believe doesn't matter. I done bad this time. I know I done bad, but I don't want to die. No one wants you to die. Oh, Miss Kinsella, I may not have gone to Harvard, but I'm not dumb. Just sign, Seth. You'll be my lawyer. Right? Just you? I'll be your lawyer. Just little old me. Joseph interrupts the story from his place in the auditorium. Uh, let's get back up. Uh, how did you become a lawyer to begin with? Uh, what? 
how did you arrive at your vocation? Oh, <laughs> how charmingly Catholic of you, Dean, my vocation. <laughs> Well, if that's too desperation, Catholic. desperation, my father took a hike before I reached the age of reason. My mother got by cleaning other people's houses. My oldest brother, Mickey, died in the service. No, not combat. A dumb accident in the motor pool garage. There was a death benefit, but it didn't last long. And my other brother, Willie, went out west coast to become a pro wrestler. That didn't happen, and we haven't heard from him since the Carter administration. I was not about to find a sugar daddy or sleep my way to the top, so I became what they used to call a spinster. I needed at least the possibility of making a little money. I didn't anticipate quite how little. Why law? A mistake, really. I loved the catechism growing up. I memorized the 95 questions, an answer for each one of them. I thought law would be like that, an answer for every question. By the time I realized how wrong I'd been, I was in too deep. So how did you become an advocate for the underrepresented? <laughs> I'm a woman in a crowded field. I take the work no one else will. The irony is, I like it. By and large, my public defender clients are guilty, which lends a certain stability and predictability that I appreciate. It's not flashy. I negotiate, I make deals. I rarely go to court except to ask the judge for more time to make a deal, which in turn will lighten her load, so she generally says yes. Add to that a few wills, conveyances, and closings each month, and. I make enough money for a nice little apartment with a balcony just big enough to eat breakfast on with my obligatory cat. I arrange my life how I like, and I do what I like with the people I like. And you're helping others and serving justice. Well, sure, th that too. So what exactly had this client, Shaden, done? Lisa, 19. Bruce, 20. Listen to Shaden prowl around outside the tent. There's somebody outside the tent. Smokey the bear, most likely. Please, take a look. You might be somebody. And then what? What do you mean? What do I do? I don't have anything to use as a weapon. I don't know. Wave your arms. Shout. I don't see how that works for a person or a bear. It's better to know. Who you say? I told you I hate camping, right? All right, I'll go. Come here. Seth reveals the knife he's holding. Bruce moves towards him. Seth begins to frisk him. Hey, what? You want money? I'll give you money. You don't have to fuel me up. Bruce, who is it? Stay there. Seth walks to the tent flaps, looks in. Who are you? Um, Lisa? You're very pretty, um, Lisa. Come on out where I can see you. Look, just take the money and go and we'll never tell anyone. Come on out, um, Lisa. We promise we won't say anything. You're coming with me, little girl. Here, take the money. You're going to pay me to do your girl. That is so generous of you. Thank you. And uh, then what happened? He raped her and killed her. Okay, that's the synopsis, but my writer has to write scenes. Uh, how did it happen? What are the steps? What happened to Bruce? Seth killed him first. And then what? You want all the details? What, what kind of freak is supposed to watch this movie? I was hoping I would distract him or tire him out. 
maybe I could make him like me, maybe care about me enough to not hurt me. You don't understand. Hurting you is what gives him pleasure, not sex. That's not fair. When I first took her off, I, I just wanted to You'll get your turn. What do you mean? First of all, you'll be alive. You'll have a lawyer and press conferences and you'll probably get a book deal. Some ex-newspaper writer will listen to your depraved spew and tidy it up into a nice true crime confession saga someone can pick up at the airport newsstand on their way to a conference in Sacramento. Right now, I get my say. Okay, but if- Go over there, get down, not a word. So, how far do we have to go with this? With what? The violence, the rape and murder scene. It feels gratuitous and cliched. Yes, but if we don't dramatize it, then Lisa's terror and suffering aren't real. They're too abstract. I'm not going to take my clothes off. It's a visible demonstration of your vulnerability. It just becomes about the appearance of my body, not Lisa's fear or the danger she's in. We lose sight of the real stakes here. So how are we supposed to present the truth about a rape and murder, which is at the core of our story? The rape is not the central thing with the moral and ethical dilemma arising from the legal profession's canon of ethics. Okay. But there is no dilemma without the rape, correct? Well, actually, any murder would be sufficient for our story. Okay, but the murder only happened to cover up the rape. Seth killed Lisa so she couldn't testify about being raped. Then he hid her body. Okay, well, we have to address the irony that Lisa's sexuality is both a potential distraction to him and a weapon against her. So, at first, Lisa was holding on to the idea that she could bring him along to keep anything really bad from happening. And even if he does rape me, and God knows I've suffered through unwanted sex before, at least maybe I could keep him from killing me. That was the main thing. My mind was racing along thinking, how do I get out of this alive? No matter what I'm doing, taking down my jeans, hooking my bra, my eyes never leave the knife. Will he put it down? Can I maneuver the two of us away from it? And all the while, as my brain is flashing red danger warnings, I summon the coquette. Do you like me? Am I pretty? Prettier than the other girls you've been with? Don't even. Get him thinking with his little brain. He doesn't speak, but he makes a sort of snort that combines derision and anticipation of delights to come. He slams into me as if it was meant to be punishment. Does he think that this constitutes lovemaking? The mix of mortification, pain, discomfort, and humiliation seem to gratify him. Some kind of twisted, emptied out husk of a person takes pleasure from this god-awful writhing about. Where does he get his ideas of a woman and her body? Is this what they serve up in Playboy and Penthouse and those magazines? I don't know where the knife is, but it doesn't seem to be in either hand. Is he talking? Am I talking back? I can't remember. I'm concentrating on not showing my terror and agony, not to mention the pain and soreness in my loins. But he's approaching his peak when he'll be least able to defend himself. But I realize too late that the knife is still under his palm. Only now he is grasping it, and it is poking right at the bottom of my rib cage on the left. And now it's inside me as well. And I am gasping, starting to drown in my own blood as he does it. He finishes, his satisfaction synchronized with my desperate gulping and wheezing. If only I could get some air, not this thick, viscous fluid that is flowing into my lungs, making it a sound that I realize is my death rattle from the satisfied smile on his face. Mission accomplished, leave us stoked. Love death. It's never good to die at 19, but I imagine the last thing you see being the, but imagine the last thing you see being the satisfied smile of this little monster. 
Before we go ahead to discuss your interviews with the defendant, uh, we need a quick refresher on the professional code of ethics uh, with regard to client communications. As you know, a lawyer shall not reveal information relating to the representation of a client unless the client gives informed consent, other than to prevent a crime or in connection with a subsequent case concerning that representation. Without this rule, free and frank exchange of information is impossible. Uh, preparation of the client's case is impossible. If the matter is criminal, defense counsel becomes an extension of the prosecutor's office, obliged to turn over evidence and effectively relieving the state of its burden of proof. There are systems in other parts of the world that operate this way, where there is no confidentiality, no free and fair trial, no true democracy. You can make light of it or bargain it away. The sanctity of the attorney-client privilege is necessary for the continued existence of the United States as a free society. Joseph exits. Eileen is in a jail interview room. What do you mean you don't remember anything? Seth. What do you mean when you say you don't remember anything? Do you remember something about that day? What did you do in the morning? Seth, sit down and talk to me. I don't remember anything. Seth. No, really, I mean it. I'm pretty sure I did something bad. Hell, I know I did, but I don't remember it. If you could show me I did it, I believe it, because this happens to me. When I do bad things, I can't remember them. <laughs> Makes things easier for you, doesn't it? This is not a scam. Really? Because there's no need to get over on me. No. No. This is a real thing that really happens in my head. I've had it ever since I was a little kid. Tell me exactly what it's like. You don't believe me. Doesn't matter. Tell me what happens in your mind when you do bad things. Well, I don't know what happens. It's just nothing there. When I try to remember, it's just a big white blank. Tabula rasa. Where did you read that? <laughs> well, if I did read it somewhere. You know I have problems, you know my story. I read your file, yes. My old man used me as a punching bag until I was old enough to throw him out. Why didn't your mother protect you? She wanted to, but... She was a drunk. She loved me. Of course she did. I had to figure out how to get enough money to get us food and keep the lights on and have the heat on. If I came up short, she'd start hitting me too, in the head. Over and over in the head. Gave me such headaches. I'm sorry. I mean, punch me, kick me, I could take that. But always with headshots. Seth, don't look up and don't look around. What? Scooch your chair over about nine inches to your left. There's somebody watching us, Scooch. It's not. That's good. Hit Rita. What? Guys in the holding cell told me about them. They've got lip readers to work on the big cases. To see what you and I... She catches herself, takes a legal document out of her briefcase, puts it on the table. Seth, lean forward and look down at this document. What is it? It's a deed of transfer I'm going to file at the clerk's office for old Martha Willoughby this afternoon. Pretend it's very important. Can I be honest with you? 
what have you been doing so far? They've got you dead to rights on the blue Bruce Fleming killing. They've got the weapon, the body, bloody clothes, and your confession. You can get that thrown out. I'll try, but that's not what they care about. They like you for Lisa Westberg, but they have no body. Right now, she's just a missing person. She's going to stay missing. Meaning? We're done, Counselor. Seth, you have to give me something. You'll give it to them. You know I can't do that. I'd lose my ticket. But you'd like to. No, I wouldn't. Why not? I'm a depraved killer, aren't I? They gotta prove it. That's how the game is played. It's true. I don't care about you. But I do care about the rules of the game. Try me tomorrow. Maybe I'll be feeling more helpful. Is that uh, typical of how these things go? I have no idea. What about uh, past experience? Brock, around 35, handsome, well-dressed, appears. Eileen, I got your message. Eileen is now in her late 20s. Did you? What do you want to do? Hello, it's good to see you too. Yes, law school is a lot of hard work. No, you don't have to tell me I'm pretty. I'm sure I look a mess. <laughs> Take all of the above as read. How's Karen? Don't be mean, I'm here to help. To offer money and solicit silence? I will support you whatever your decision is. I don't have a decision. I'm Catholic, you know. Seriously, I'll, I'll cover whatever costs you incur. All my costs, including the intangibles? No, what I mean, Eileen. I didn't ask for money. I want to know what you're going to do. Meaning? Will you be the child's father? <sighs> I have children. That's not an answer. It would kill Karen if... It being the truth of what you've done? Yes. <sighs> you know what the irony is? I think it's irony, but I'm studying law, not literature. I would take you in a second. Previous wife, children, the whole package. Even like this, unable to say what you feel or figure out the right thing. With all your indecision and fear, I love you and I would take you. But I'm not going to get that choice, am I? Eileen, you've got to understand it's... It doesn't matter. I'm having the baby. What about law school? If you will help me raise the child and provide the necessary support, both in terms of money and in your time, attention, and love. I will devote myself full time to them, whether you leave your wife or not, marry me or not. If you can be there for the two of us, I will take that deal, shamefully compromised as it is. How could I? Oh, otherwise, I will have the child at the Sisters of the Renewal and they will find a home for her. Or him. I could make a donation. Well, I'm not going to refuse on behalf of the sisters. That's their business. God, Eileen, I, I never meant to. That's exactly the problem. If you could have just meant to, if you could have just pledged yourself to some kind of meaning for what we felt. I wanted to give myself to you, but you weren't there to receive me. So I want my child to be with someone who really, really wants her. If you had wanted all that, why did you ever start with me? You knew who I was, all my obligations. Call me young and foolish. I didn't know I was supposed to treat a relationship like a portfolio. 
complete with price history, potentials, and forecasts. What about now? I'm out of the market. What if I told you I, I wanted to adopt the baby and raise him with my other children? <laughs> you don't want to do that. Why not? Just one more child in an already lively household. How would you explain it? What would your story be? I wouldn't need a story. Why couldn't I just have suddenly had a generous impulse towards an unfortunate child? Do you really want me to tell you? Or do you just want to take a moment and think about how it would look to everyone else? I just want to do the right thing. It's too late for either of us. We just have to do the least bad thing. We loved each other. We brought life into the world. Isn't that an unalloyed good? Brock, I... I can't. I've told you what will happen. Now, just manage that with some grace. Sorry. That's a start. So, how did you get shot in to talk? Oh, I gave him what every client needs, a swift dose of reality. My head is really hurting again today. Eileen opens up Coke. I hope this helps, because what I'm going to tell you won't. Thanks. The prosecutor wants to kill you, and there's no good reason for him not to. Bullshit. You're the most hated man in the state. All the polls favor your execution. Most people think a trial is a waste of money. You might go down in history for bringing lynching back to New Jersey. The governor's re-election would be guaranteed. They wouldn't give me that for Bruce Fleming, and that's all they got me for, It's Bruce Fleming. They'd like to get me for Lisa Westberg. Scooch over again. But they still don't have a body. They can't find a body. That is true. If someone knew the location of Miss Westberg, dead or alive, they might be able to exchange that information for something of great value. That's a big if. Seth, I can't get up on my hind legs in court and claim that you didn't kill Bruce Fleming. The assistant prosecutor will mop the floor with me and with you. And very likely, the prosecutor himself will show up special to get his picture taken as grind his heel into both our faces. It wouldn't matter that they can't prove you murdered Lisa. They'll put you to death for it anyway. I thought you were a pro. There has to be a defense you can put up. There is. What? Insanity. No way. I'm not crazy. Then get ready to die. There's no way to prove I'm insane. I don't want to prove it. I want to plead it. Negotiate a plea of insanity and get them to take the death penalty off the table in exchange for Lisa's whereabouts. I don't know where she is. Concentrate. I'll give you a minute. And scooch over again. You're almost in profile to the door. I think she... Stop. Just just a second. Eileen, you! Moves, Eileen moves Seth out of the way and addresses the person through the, the, through the door directly. You, stop pretending you're not there and get me another Coke. Stat. Go. Seth, make a picture in your mind and tell me what you see. 
She was so pretty. Tall, almost foot taller than me. She looked like the captain of the cheerleaders. What happened to her, Seth? Why can't we find her? She got killed by my knife. I was lying next to her and we were all wet and the wet was to blood and she got killed. What happened to her? I and what didn't happened to her? Want anyone to, to see her like that. What, she what was did so you pretty. what did you do with her? She was so pretty. I hid her. Where did you hide her? Right next to Julie. Julie? Who's Julie? Julie. It's dark. She was uh, 14 or 15. Just starting in, you know. She was nice to me at first. What was Julie's last name? Ander. Vander, Julie, Vander, Vander, uh, Vandegraaff, Julie Vandegraaff? She was a sweet little thing, Julie Vandegraaff. Where are they? Ooh. Lisa and Julie, where did you put them? Put them. Their bodies, you hid them where? Why do you think that I... Seth, this is not the time unless you want to die in the next six months. You have to give me this information. You know the Roseberry Mine? Where is that? Tell the dear. Where's the mine head? I'll draw you a picture. I watched him take childish delight in drawing that diagram as if he were playing Peter Pan and he was mapping uh, Captain Hook's treasure chest. That's this drawing you gave me, right? I knew Julie. Her parents belonged to my parish. Helena Vandegraaff and I had been on the parish social concerns committee together. She'd been in my house and I in hers. No one had ever put her together with Seth Shodden. When she disappeared two and a half years earlier, there had been search parties every day for a month and every weekend for months after that until the ground was too soft to reveal any footprints or tracks. The Van de Graaffs had Father David say a prayer for her return at Mass every Sunday. Her 15th birthday picture had been displayed everywhere. Her face was burnt into my retinas. Why did you go? Why, why didn't you just give the map to the police? Kevin I could and Eileen are side by side in the cab of a pickup. I couldn't. It would be a violation of his rights. The only exception to privilege is to prevent a crime. If Seth was telling the truth, the girls were already dead. If we could give the families the locations of their bodies, maybe we could keep him off death row. That was our only bargaining chip, and I had to find out if it was any good. This is as close as I can get with the truck. Okay. Uh, stay here. I followed Seth's weird little map and walked up a forest path carpeted with dry pine needles until I found the top of the shaft he had drawn. I looked down into it, but I couldn't see anything. Even with the Coast Guard flashlight I'd brought, I went back to Kevin. Eileen hands Kevin a dollar bill. Take this. What? Why? Take it. 
okay? Um, now what? I've just hired you as part of the defense team. Well, I, I don't know. And, he, and you're uh, bound by the same confidentiality requirements as I am. You can never tell anyone what you see or what you do. Do you understand? I get it. This is not for him. It's for me. Double pinky swear. We made our way back to the shaft. Hold me by my ankles. She climbs into the shaft. He holds her ankles. Shit! There's two of them. There's a, a blue sneaker. Hold tight. I, I'm going to try and, and, and get over and see her hair. Oh, shit! Pull me up, Kevin! Kevin, pull me up! Hurry! Get me out of here, Kevin! Kevin extricates her. She sits on the ground shaken. Tentatively, Kevin puts his arms around her and she's allow she allows it. It was her head. Could you see if it was, uh... It came off! Oh, God. No wonder you're upset. I've tampered with a body. Is that, uh... It's a felony. It's a goddamn felony. Was it? It was Julie. Mother of God, help me. It was Julie. I turned pages at her cello recital. Was Lisa... Yes, she was there too. They were folded up like bedrolls, the bastard. I'm sorry, man. This is awful. It's a good thing. It's our one shot to save Seth Shodden's life. Is this what you really want to do? It's the job. It's the goddamn fucking job. What are you going to do? I'm going to get the best advice I can. I mean, right now. There's got to be a tavern around here somewhere, right? Uh, let's go back to the truck. Joseph enters and seats himself in his office. You know, Eileen, uh, Dr. Stein is our leading expert on ethics. I'm not. He's not my confessor. Which one of us are you talking to right now? Uh, the lawyer or the priest? Father, if I was in confession with you. Mm hmm. The priest, I see. And I told you something I learned in a privileged communication with a client. Would I be violating that privilege? A secret within a secret. Interesting. Let me see. I would be constrained from divulging that information by the sanctity of confession. So that's good. Practically speaking, that information could not be given to law enforcement. That's what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, but the privilege is not strictly for the purpose of preventing information from leaking out. It is a bond with your client and with every client you have had and ever will have. No matter the circumstances of our communication, you would still be violating that bond. At the very least, you would need their consent. No, I guess I'm not going to ask my client if I can talk things over with my priest. Damn, 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 damn it to hell. Maybe you should hear my confession anyway. Oh, I mean, <laughs> what do you have to confess? Profanity. Bullshit. Right now, tell me your problem without breaking confidentiality. Father, what do you do when what your ethics requires you to do violates your morality? Are we talking about a conflict between the law and one's spiritual faith? 
because <laughs> that debate has been pretty long settled. Hundreds of years of martyrs have testified to that. No, I'm not talking about an unjust law. We're talking about legal ethics, yes? Yes. By which you are bound, not only by fear of punishment, but by your oath, the giving of a promise. Yes. The question is, under what circumstances should you violate that oath and those ethics? Is it purely a matter of conscience? Both cases involve weighing who benefits and who is harmed. And the greatest good for the greatest number. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Yes, the English philosopher Jeremy Bentham. <laughs> I was thinking of the Vulcan philosopher, Mr. Spock. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are neither English nor Vulcans. We are Christians. We can't use numbers as metrics to measure right and wrong. I'm afraid that if I uphold my duty to my profession, to our legal system, to the Constitution even, I'm going to hurt people I care about and violate the teachings of the church. I don't think I want to hear it, Brian. I'm not sure this conversation is covered by any privilege, legal or religious. You wouldn't repeat any of this, would you? It is many years earlier. We were in a convent. Eileen turns to Reverend Mother. You will keep my secret, won't you, Reverend Mother? Dear Eileen, while I can't approve of how this child came to be, we are very grateful that she will give her life and that she will fulfill the wish of a good Catholic couple to have and raise a child of their own. Rest assured, you are loved, Eileen. If there is any judgment, that is reserved to God alone. Every child comes into the world as a token of God's love, and that includes you, dear child. Now, Sister Ursula is a licensed midwife, and she will go over all the details and make all the arrangements with you. I'll take you to her, and then I want you to put your feet up a while before you go back to the city. No argument. You need rest. And to answer your question, yes, of course, we will keep your secret. We're good at that. That's a great question, Anne. <laughs> the reason I chose to both star and produce in a television film for the first time was because of this utterly remarkable story and because of my commitment to bring out the utterly complete and utterly unvarnished truth, there were no holds barred. We had many meetings with the network because there's a lot of sensitive and upsetting material in a story like this, but I believe it's important to bring the truth before the public. It might seem paradoxical considering that I first became well known by solving crimes while wearing an electric blue bikini and three inch heels, but I did not simply accept that state of affairs. <laughs> See, by the end of the first season, I had gotten them to put a lining in that bikini. And by halfway through the second season, there were back straps on those heels. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I learned that by persistence and persuasion, I could affect change. I became an empowered woman. One problem remained. Even though the show was called Lady Dicks, uh, the female detectives all took orders from a shadowy, unseen daddy figure, Big Johnson. We could not do anything about that, but when the opportunity came for me to form my own production company, and make TV movies. I was looking for stories about women who call the shots themselves. I found this amazing story of a female lawyer whose case is taught in all the law schools and everything. <laughs> to get to the meat of this story, which by the way, we are calling body politics. <laughs> I decided I would personally interview the woman at the very center of our story. 
So to protect her privacy, in the film, my character is called Frances Armani, but her real name is Eileen Kinsella. So when Eileen became a lawyer, she didn't want to be bossed around by any men. So she started a solo practice. And to this day, she only employs women. I decided to follow her example of putting women in charge and our community continuity girl, um, second AD and the hair and makeup departments would all be female. <laughs> I know the ethics and evidence stuff is all very important, but the main thing to me was to show the chance it was the, yeah, the chance to show a woman who is in total control of her career and her life and not running and fetching for some man. Besides, you know how it is when there's trouble with a man, even if you call the cops, they arrive an hour later and then side with him and then let him off with a warning and slap you on the ass and call you honey. I mean, what is even the point? <laughs> People ask why I'm a sole practitioner. I originally intended to work for a firm and interviewed a few places, but men did not hire women to be lawyers back then, unless you wanted to be a library rat and never see a courtroom. I couldn't even find another woman to partner with, so I hung out my shingle and hoped for the best. You think it's great to be your own boss, but you're at the mercy of everyone and everything possible. You're never in charge. For example, now I had a bargaining chip in working out a plea for Seth. I wasn't asking for him to be set free. The chances are he'd never leave the prison hospital. Same as a life sentence, really. And we could give the family's closure. You take your chances. Which reminds me of my secretary, Ruth. She worked cheap, but she couldn't type, answer a phone, keep my calendar, or be anywhere near her desk when I needed her. The result is that one morning I discovered I had an appointment with the parents of Julie Vandegraaff the moment they walked into my office. Helena and Willem Vandegraaff enter the office. Uh, Helena, it's been too long come in you remember willem please sit down did ruth offer you coffee who's ruth uh, never mind i can certainly get you coffee myself we're fine please sit down <clears throat> well then uh, what can i do you're the lawyer for that killer I represent Mr. Shodden, who has been charged with two homicides, yes. The police say they think he can help find with four of the missing persons cases? They've never spoken to me about it. Uh, County Prosecutor Sean Pilkington uh, believes that Shodden may be able to help with information about the disappearances of Nancy Clem, 16 of Blairstown, Susan Mallory, 17 of Port Murray, and Linda Taylor and Julie Vandegraaff, both 15, and both from Alamucci. I remember when Julie went missing, I came to help search for the first few weekends. I thought I remembered that. Didn't I say so, Willem? It must be thoroughly awful not knowing. Oh, well, I think by now I know. Anything could have happened. Eileen, if she's alive, then she's probably been forced to. I know, I know. Two and a half years of that life. I'd rather she were. Shut up, you damn fool. She's not a Studebaker with too much mileage and a bent frame. She's our girl. And I want to back any way she is if, if she's been hurt. We'll heal her. If she's lost, we'll bring her home. If she's dead, we'll put her into the consecrated ground. This world or the next, we'll bring her through. But right now, we're neither here nor there. 
I'm not clear on what you want me. Julie was not an easy birth. I was already getting on. Her brothers are about 10 years older than her. She was a little extra blessing. She had to be induced prematurely and she spent a month in the NICU. William used to go directly from work every day and let her tiny little hand hold his finger. Oh, this is her christening. It's her dress for the first communion and uh, oh, here's where she went away to sleep away camp. And here she is in the regional orchestra, second <laughs> there for the whole region. She played beautifully. And here she is with her friends on the soccer team. This is when she won the Silver Cross, the Silver Award as a cadet in the Girl Scouts. The council director came from the other end of the state to make the awards. Willem has lost control, has left the room before he loses control. She's not a saint. She had a boyfriend when she was 13. He was a nice enough boy, I suppose, uh, for a Greek. But she was too young for the things that boys and girls get up to when they're alone. I told her there'd be time enough for that. <sighs> Last minute morning, I saw her. Uh, what? Nothing. Julie was running for um, student council and she was supposed to make a speech. She was up all night rewriting it over and over. And after school, she was supposed to go to her friend Natalie's house after school to practice giving the speech. And when Julie didn't call, I called Natalie's mother. Julie never got there. And you know what, Eileen? That's just the thing that gives me hope. This poor girl was doing too much. She had the sports and the school newspaper and econ club. Don't ask me what econ club is, but in all of her classes. And now she wanted to add student council. And I think she just didn't realize how much stress she was putting on herself. That was me in school. And she may have just felt like it was all too much and she was so young and maybe she didn't think she had anyone to talk to. So she just, uh, I don't know, snapped at something and picked up and ran away. Maybe she went to New York or went West like your brother and, and uh, my dream. It could have happened. I'm not saying it would be good. She might have gone through with God knows what, but what I really want for you to tell me is that you have no information, that, that this man shot and never saw her, doesn't know anything, that her disappearance has nothing to do with his case. Helena Willem, I I know this is difficult to understand. Oh, no. There's nothing, nothing I would like better than to put your minds at ease. But there are things which are just not in my gift to do. Here it comes. This is not some kind of line. That is exactly what it is. This is lawyer language. Mealy mouthed. Eileen, mm -hmm. Eileen, we don't want you to break any rules. We just have to know whether or not she's gone. Sister Ursula, a midwife, appears. She's gone. We can't have any peace. Eileen, can you hear me? She's gone. One way or the other. There is no heartbeat. There has not been a heartbeat for the past hour. We've been monitoring. The child is gone. It is 25 years ago. Elizabeth. We have to proceed with the delivery immediately. 
delivery? Yes, we still have to deliver the child. She pushes Eileen's sleeve up, rubs her arm with alcohol. I'm going to give you medication to begin labor since it may not begin naturally. She administers the shot. Now, you stay here and rest. And when we're ready for you, we'll bring you right in. My lily bit. I don't know if you can understand what we feel as parents. Did I hear you say the child's name is Elizabeth? The father's name? We can talk about that later. Now, remember everything you learned about labor, your breathing, and everything, because it's going to be pretty much the same. I'll be back in half an hour to check on you, but you let me know if the nurse, you let the nurse know if contractions start. Sister Ursula exits, and we are back in Eileen's office. It's not fair of us to expect you to know how we feel. I... I resent your implication that I can't understand. No, I have not raised a child myself, but I am a human being. I understand caring and giving and loss. Your promise to that killer is more important than our daughter. The promise is not made to a killer. It's made to our system of justice. It's made to you and to Helena and to everyone who might ever need a lawyer. Look, would you want Father David repeating what he hears in confession? Oh, that's different. It's not. Father David is serving God. And I serve his children. Except my child. That thing in prison is no child of God. Maybe not. But I already made the promise, and there's no take backsies in the law. What can you tell us? That, at least, is the right question. Well, I can't tell you anything. Eileen! It's the God's honest truth, and I can't tell you how badly I regret it. You regret it. You don't have a daughter that you put 15 years of your life and all of your heart into only to know nothing, not even if she's alive. Oh God, I'd do anything not to be in this situation. <laughs> yes, I'm sure it's terrible for you. Helena, I care very much for Julie too. I have to remember. I have to remember that it's not your fault, Eileen, that you can't know what you're doing to me. Sister Ursula bustles in again. Ah, we're awake again. How are we feeling? What do you mean, we? You need to rest for a few hours. We'll give you a quick look over and then you can go. What about? What about what, dear? The baby, Elizabeth. Well, you know what happened, dear. Can't I see her? No, Eileen. Reverend Mother has studied this question very closely and has come to the conclusion that it does no good for the mothers to see their departed children. It can be very disorienting, disturbing even. It can lead to, how can I say, a misattachment. A misattachment? It's natural to want to see and hold the body, but the soul has already gone on its journey. The Lord is finished with that body, and it's not healthy to dwell on it. But I want to hold her, to kiss her. Eileen, settle down. At least say goodbye. You can do that right now, in prayer, my dear. I'll stay here and pray with you. No, I want to hold her. I want to feel her in my arms. Eileen, you must let go. How can I let go when I've never even had her? She was with you all of those months. She's been gone all these months. Years. We've already missed so much of her life, Eileen. Uh, I know you know something. For the sake of a desperate mother. Helena, there's, there's nothing else to say. You have no idea how terrible this is. No. 
I don't mean I what don't. I don't mean what I'm going through. What you're doing. It's terrible. And you're a monster. I I don't give a good goddamn about your professional oath to your constitutional responsibility. What I'm talking about is something sacred. Me too. I will never understand, never understand, and never forgive. If I pray for you, it will be for you to burn in hell. Willem. Eileen, darling, we need you to sign this. It's just a routine form to release a child to our care. Don't worry, dear. You'll see her. Uh, We'll all meet again in heaven. Nobody really believes in that limbo stuff anymore. Sister Uh, Ursula leaves, leaving Eileen alone on stage. The lights fade. End of Act One. Sanctity by Kerr Lockhart, Act Two. In the darkness, we hear a woman's voice. Lights up. My work, perhaps there are traces of it here and there, such as the exquisite placement of the church right across the square from the courthouse, which often makes it possible to attend midday service, and there are many days it's needed. I have no idea what the liturgy committee thinks about it, but our cantor has taken up the work of Hildegard von Bingen. Don't get me started. She did so much for a woman of the 11th century, composer, theologian, physician, even a playwright. I don't remember how I first learned about her. I think someone gave me a cassette of her music. It's that music that makes her my personal chaperone to the next world. She said she lived in communion with the living light. I don't know what that means, but I think this is what it sounds like. (laughs) Joseph appears in a pulpit, or is it a lectern? I am frequently asked why the church frowns on cremation and on dispersal of the ashes after cremation. Uh, The conventional explanation uh, involves the second coming, but I think it's more meaningful to look at the teachings about the sanctity of the body. Uh, The human body is clearly a very special thing to God. We are created in his image. The body is the vessel of our Lord that he chose to send the word to us here on earth in the form of the incarnation. We don't believe it should be handled casually or offhandedly, and that's why we caution against all forms of self-destruction. Not only suicide, but alcohol, drug abuse, 
masturbation, tattoos, cosmetic surgery, uh, and other permanent alterations. All of these sully the temple that is the human body wherein dwells the soul. Uh, when that soul departs the body, we revere it for its service to the life of the spirit. And we urge the believer to honor the body by keeping it intact after death, if at all possible. Uh, for many of us, the sight of the body of a departed loved one is the thing that truly brings the understanding of both uh, the terrible finality and the beautiful peace of death and allows us to seal our experience with that person by bidding farewell to their body. In the secular world rates and ranks things and indeed people for their usefulness. The faithful rate them by their sacredness, their sanctity. That is a great question, Claudia. So back in 1951, Alfred Hitchcock made a film called I Confess, in which Montgomery Clift played a priest who hears the confession of a killer and then is accused of that very murder himself. So not only does he know the identity of the real culprit, but he has solid evidence, evidence that is protected by the seal of confession. The problem was the overwhelming majority of moviegoers didn't know about or understand that a priest can't divulge what he hears in confession. They thought Montgomery Clift was nuts, that he should have gone to the police, that he had a duty to protect the community from an admitted killer. The picture was a flop. <laughs> Apparently not enough Catholics go to the movies. So the question for our film was, if audiences don't understand the secrecy of confession, how will they understand attorney-client privilege? Also, we needed to give the main character an interesting backstory. <laughs> so we made her a former stripper. So you found her. Bet she was surprised they told the truth. Congratulations. You're a murderer and a pervert, but at least you're not a liar. So what happened to Julie? How did she get there? She wasn't a sex pot like the others. Barely more than a child. Kids that age, you can tell them anything. They haven't learned yet. Girls learn young. You're so pretty. You're such a pretty girl. You're really blossoming now, you. You're becoming a woman, Julie. Eileen answers as the 15-year-old Julie. I, I guess so. You should be proud of your womanhood, Julie. Are you proud? <sighs> proud? Your body is declaring to the world I am ready to be loved, aren't you? You're ready. I've never... Uh... I'm not gonna hurt you. I'm not gonna touch you. Just let me see how beautiful you are. What do you want me to... Seth unbuttons her blouse. That was easy. Go ahead. Do the rest. Show me. Eileen as Julie unbuttons her blouse. Seth pushes it off her shoulders and it falls to the floor. Oh, yes. So pretty. Eileen as Julie hunches her shoulders and elbows forward in modesty and shame. 
I'll join you. He takes off his prison work shirt to reveal his pudgy white body. See? Out of pants. Seth takes off his pants to reveal his tidy whiteies. That wasn't so hard. Now your turn, and we can hug. You don't have to look embarrassed. Just having fun. Give me a little kiss. Seth steps towards her. She pushes him violently away. No! That's it. What happened? She got stabbed with my knife. Seth, did you? Such a pretty little girl. All done, dear. You can put your clothes back on, dear. Eileen Mother's... puts her clothes back on. Mother Superior will see you. <sighs> she got stabbed with my knife. You wanted to see me. You look well. How do you feel? I'm well, thank you, Reverend Mother. You should be able to resume your life as a student soon. I hope so, Reverend Mother. I want to see my child. Your child has left, my dear. Her soul is already on its journey, and we are all praying for her swift reunion with our Lord. But her body, it's still here. The body is being prepared to lie in a special and beautiful resting place we have for the unbaptized, our garden of eternal hope, where there will be... I want to see her. That is not our practice in this community. I, I need to hold her, to tell her I love her, to say goodbye. Wiser heads than our, yours and even mine have considered this question. We will not upset our young woman with the sight of their lifeless children. I don't wish to be blunt, but it is often extremely shocking and a terrible blow to the nerves. I assure you, I've seen much worse. And in some cases, a woman like you. A mother. Like you alone in the world, can form an unnatural attachment with this earthly. She is mine, and I love her, and I need to hold her. Eileen, my dear, it will prolong your period of grieving and cause you to dwell on the unnatural appearance of your child. Unnatural? Why should she be unnatural? She is just as God made her and just as he took her. Eileen, my child. I don't need a long time, not an hour or less. Let me stay a little while with her, rock her, sing to her, tell her about her mother who loves her so she can take that with her. Eileen, she's gone. There's nothing you can tell her except in prayer. Let me pray now. Dear God, tell her. Tell this woman, unlock her heart, and let her give me my lily bit to mourn like any other mother. Tell her! Tell her! Reverend Mother embraces Eileen. Shh. Eileen, hush. You've had trouble enough. Your child is without sin and will dwell in God's favor forever. You have been absolved yourself. All is done with and all is well. Don't prolong your pain. Leave the memory of what happened here. We can absorb the weight of a lot of pain and grief. Leave it all here. Go and begin again. I want to hold her. Rita Nichols, prosecuting attorney, enters. I 
Eileen, I'm not going to be some kind of easy date. Some of your colleagues have been in the past cases. You're not going to walk away with 10 to 15 on this one. Risky as it was, I had to take my wretched little bargaining chip to Rita Nichols, Nick, the assistant prosecutor, to see what I could get for it. Did you hear me, Eileen? No soft deals. I wouldn't even try. My opening offer is life. Too bad. Mine is death. We've got so much on your guy. The evidence locker is bursting. He's nailed six ways from Sunday. I took this meeting purely out of courtesy. Honestly, I can't see what you could possibly offer that would be of any interest. This is a plea negotiation, right? If you like. What I'd like is your confirmation that what we say here is confidential. Confirmed. Hypothetically speaking, what would you say if, for example, some of your other homicide and missing persons cases could be cleared using information provided by my client? Eileen, what are you saying? I didn't say anything. I asked you a question. What type of information? How solid is it? How conclusive? Very solid and very conclusive. Mary Ross. He did marry Ross. Can we make a deal? Robin Wright. He told you where to find Robin Wright. He'll be committed to the State Psychiatric Hospital for life. I can't do that. Why not? Because if they decide he's cured, they'll let him walk. He's not going to be cured. Julie. Julie Vandegraaff. She's perfect. Everyone was looking for her. Her parents are on us all the time, getting into the news on every anniversary. You're offering me Julie Vandergraaf. What if I was? No. Nick, you could have this all. I don't need Julie. I've got him for the Fleming murder and maybe Westberg. He's gonna be living in our house. We'll have years and years to get this story out of him. Why should he tell you if you're just going to kill him? I can't be seen offering mercy to one of the most perverted and depraved killers of this past decade. We've got smart investigators. We'll solve all the cases, whether or not Mr. Shodden decides to help us. No deal. Don't think of my client, Nick. Think about the Vandegraaffs. You have the power to relieve their heartache and pain and give them some resolution. So do you. No, I don't. The guards bring Seth in. So, there was a trial. My only choice was to have Seth plead not guilty by reason of insanity. He fought me every step of the way. I'm not crazy, and I'm not going to sit in a loony bin. You'd rather sit in an electric chair then? We still have the death penalty in this state. I'm not crazy. I just didn't know what I was doing. That's what not guilty by reason of insanity means. Is there another version of the word insanity? Dr. Florian, a professional, takes the witness stand. Please state your name and occupation for the court. I am Dr. Louise Florian. I'm a forensic psychiatrist. Have you examined the defendant, Mr. Seth Shotton? I have. Please describe your findings. Mr. Shotton told the police of an absolutely horrendous upbringing, continuous beatings and mental abuse by his parents, literally no formal schooling, working as an indentured servant at the age of seven, slaughtering bulls at the age of eight, graduating to drinking the blood of the animals and having sex with them. He also told them of a long history of rape. Objection, Your Honor. These are found in the state's own exhibits, 4C, 4D, 4E, and 6A. Here say, Your Honor, if counsel wants to open up the defendant's history, she should put Mr. Shodden on the stand. She knows very well that she can't use these statements to prove their veracity. Dr. Florian, does it matter whether or not these statements are true? No. Why not? 
Because, true or not, the fact that he made the statement is an indicator of his pathology. Ms. Nichols, I take it there's no doubt that the police are telling the truth that Mr. Shodden made these statements, is there? Withdrawn. So, the psychiatrist went on to make out a portrait in technicolor and surround sound of Shodden as a sick, twisted puppy from a sick, twisted background with only the loosest grip on the concept of right and wrong. Then we moved on to the physical evidence. Kevin takes the witness stand. Uh, Kevin Willis, I'm an investigator with the public defender detailed to work with the counsel for Mr. Shodden. Mr. Willis, in the course of your initial interview with Mr. Shotton, what did he tell you about Lisa Westberg? Uh, Lisa, uh, she was the one with the blue sneaker, right? Not the other body? There is a hubbub starting. Other body? Objection. Mr. Willis is referring to someone or something which has not been introduced into evidence. Uh, Your Honor, may I approach? The hubbub fades partially. Eileen addresses the school, uh, the school audience. Now we were screwed. I asked the judge if she would see me ex parte to preserve the privilege, and she said my witness had destroyed that privilege, and now everybody knew what we knew. From then on, Nichols was out to get us, and she wasn't the only one. She held a press conference. Uh, after court to announce that we had always known where the bodies of the girls were, that we had attempted a shabby subversion of law by trying to make a deal to help the quote, raping, murdering cow fucker, unquote. Reporter babble and flashbulb, flashbulb start. Well, that's not how I would have described the defendant, no, but it is our duty to get the best possible result for our client and no, I wouldn't have described their bodies as bargaining chips or as pawns in the game of law. I sleep just fine. Thank you. How about you? Flashes and the babble fade away. Kevin enters with a 12 gauge shotgun. Here's what you asked for. Are you sure you need it? Eileen takes the gun, expertly cracks and pumps it. death threats in my mailbox, on the phone all night, a dead fish in my car, an unlit Molotov cocktail in the backyard. No, I don't think I'm being hysterical if that's what you meant. Eileen, I'm sorry I let the cat out the bag. Well, I guess I didn't prepare you properly. That cat was never going to stay in the bag anyway. Do you need me tomorrow? Your testimony is finished. I, I didn't mean that. I, I mean, do you need me to help you get in and out of the building safely? That sounds like a good idea. How did you feel when the verdict came down? Relieved it was over. And the sentence? I won. 25 to life and his supermax was a win. He didn't get death. And that's what it was all about. Yeah, I felt like I was a good lawyer. Then you must have been in shock when you were arrested and handcuffed as you left the courtroom. I don't know why the handcuffs. I was released later that day. And two days after that, I went to the funerals for the Graff. Westbergs are Presbyterian and no one knew me over there. The Van de Graaffs, of course, belong to Our Lady. So I snuck in after the service had begun. I lit a candle and said a prayer and sat in the back. Thankfully, nobody saw me. At the time, I had never heard of Hildegard, but I was transported by her music. Father Joseph disappears. We hear Father David over the public address system. 
I suppose there is no heavier responsibility for a priest than to lead the community in saying farewell to a child. A child is the vessel of our hope, of promise, of knowledge and enlightenment yet to come. Unburdened by the fears, jealousies, grievances we find ourselves cherishing as adults. We are born to die, and each child is a phoenix arising from the ashes of our sin and pain to remind us of joy and of the power of God's promises. So as we struggle with the sorrow we feel today at this crushing loss, we must remember all the sorrows we and Julie have been spared and lift her up as a shining avatar of love and of possibility. You were charged with the criminal offense of tampering with a dead body. What the respondent did in this case was not only reprehensible, but disgusting. To find a dead body and not cover it, not report it to the police or the health authorities, but to continue to let it rot, to let the families continue to hope and to suffer, while this officer of the court, smug in her private knowledge, tries to leverage that fruit of the poisonous tree into a sweet deal for her deranged and dangerous client. In fact, what she leaves in that mine shaft is the very evidence of how deranged and dangerous that murderer is. This is not a model we can hold up to society, that lawyers leave dead bodies lying around, helter-skelter, when they think that it's advantageous to their cases and their careers. Upholding the rights of dangerous criminals should not violate the basic laws of human decency. She might have a point there. Meanwhile, there was a hearing regarding my possible disbarment. Enter Gordon McElroy, a country-style lawyer, carrying two glasses of beer, which he sets on a table between them. The problem is, Eileen, that you have two problems. I hired a local lawyer who had a little experience in these matters, but more importantly, would not look threatening to the panel. One is that the Bar Associate uh, Bar Association is a private group and its findings are not actually governed by the law. They can sort of make their own rules. I mean, there are guidelines, but it's really very, very subjective, which is why the judge can take or leave their recommendations. But the judges always take their recommendations. The other problem is, well, bodies. People are funny about bodies, especially dead ones. If Seth Shaden had been a drug dealer and had just told you where to find a brick of cocaine or a briefcase full of money, or even the pickaxe he'd put in his grandma's head, you wouldn't be ta taken and talking to a broken old country lawyer. You'd be sitting in your back garden right now sipping some chamomile tea. Orange Pico. Yeah. And you're not that broken down. Oh, well, don't let the sick silk socks fool you. <laughs> But bodies, well, <laughs> Eileen, have you ever been to an Irish wake? You know, my dog was Hugh Kinsella. Oh, that's right. Well, you know then, you can't have a proper wake without a body. You can't see someone off unless you can actually see them. It's part of the mourning process. Are you trying to make me feel worse? Well, I'm just trying to tell you that this is deeply cultural. Meaning it's hopeless. No, no, just that it's going to take a long time. There has been, you know, there's has to be a lot of healing and a lot of adjustment and a lot of heat that will have to be cooled. That's my defense. Wait for everyone to cool down. Do you have a better one? The code of professional responsibility. <laughs> The code of uh, professional responsibility does not have to run for re-election like our judges do. The code of professional responsibility does not need to hold on to law clients like the officers of the Bar Association do. The code of professional responsibility does not have to look people in the eye and say, I know you can't understand this, but I did the right thing. No, I'm the one that gets to do that. You're not disbarred yet. 
go back to your office, take care of your clients, and stay out of the papers. Hello, Jake. I read in the paper that you're opening up two new stores around Newton. I think I ought to look at those leases before you sign, and we should review all your... You have. Who's doing the... Alice Marshall. Does Alice know about the... You told her she's reviewing it. No, no, that that's great. She's great. I'm, I'm glad you're taking care of it. Oh, you too, Jake. Louise, it's Eileen Kinsella. Well, it's sure it's going to all blow over soon. Louise, it's the 10th of the month and my retainer. Oh, you have Bill Galloway, eh? He, he's very good. Say, maybe I could call you after all this. You don't think. Um, I understand. Yes, I, I understand. Uh, of course, Louise. Of course, I did take it personally. People I had represented upward of 15 or 20 years abandoned me for obeying a rule they couldn't grasp. I wasn't Eileen Kinsella. I was the monster who left children's bodies out in the cold to rot in order to save the life of a psychotic deviant. I took this case to make a little more money, and I wound up losing nearly everything. One good thing, though, I had an excuse to fire Ruth. <laughs> She's fine. She makes four times what I paid her, selling needlepoint on, needlepoint on Etsy, and travels the country in an RV visiting her grandchildren. My practice away. I dropped the lease of my office. I stopped paying malpractice insurance. I started selling real estate down in Mercer County where nobody knew me. Oh, and oh, I had a small nervous breakdown, just a week or 10 days. Didn't get out of bed except to get some more grandma's country oatmeal cookies with extra raisins. It's not that bad nutritionally, really. Check the label. Then I got a call. Eileen Kinsella. I have a firm policy. I do not talk to the press. Ms. Kinsella, you are an American hero. Were you trying to reach the VFW? Their phone number is almost exactly like... The name of Eileen Kinsella <laughs> will go down as that of one of the greatest defenders of our constitutional rights in history. I, I want to tell your story on national television. So you are a reporter. This is Morgan Shepard. What paper are you with? Morgan Shepard. Star of Lady Dicks, Wednesday nights on ABC. Oh, well, I, I don't know anything about entertainment law. Well, I, I want to produce a movie for television that tells the story of your heroic journey. Oh, really? Is, is that the sort of thing you do? If you give me permission. <laughs> well, um, who would play me? I would. <laughs> yes, of course. Silly me. I don't know anything about these things. What am I supposed to do? I will make this as simple and straightforward as I can. I didn't understand two thirds of what she was talking about. A pickup deal and turnaround with an option clause for the packaging. But I did understand that she wanted to pay me a whole big pile of money, enough to keep me from having to sell my body. Don't laugh. I didn't have a better plan at that time. Do people really want to see this kind of thing on TV? Eileen, I have an agreement with ABC that they will put anything I make on at 9 p.m. on any night of the week I name. <laughs> I'm bigger than Valerie Bertinelli. Imagine that. 
There's two small stipulations. Stipulate. I get to sit in on your meetings with counsel for the disbarment proceedings. And? You don't get disbarred. I'll try. <laughs> Rita and Helena enter the hearing room. Please state your name for the bar committee. Helena Vandergraaf. You are the mother of Julie Vandergraaf, who was murdered by the respondent's client, Seth Schotten? Yes. In your own words, please describe your feelings about the incident, which is the subject of this ethical complaint. What do you mean about her finding Julie? Yes. And not telling us? Yes, tell us anything you can about it. First, that we have to hear about this on the radio and read it in the newspaper. I know Eileen. Eileen knew Julie. And we belong to the same parish. My husband Willem and I went to see Eileen in her office. We begged her to tell us anything she knew. What did you want Ms. Kinsella to say? I wanted her to speak the truth. I wanted her to tell us what she knew when she knew it. Why do we even have to ask? We're in the parish directory. She could have called us. It... Instead, we had to chase after her and embarrass her into a meeting in her office. Rita hands Helena a manila envelope. Tell me about the contents of this envelope. I started that for Julie's memorial. Pictures, certificates, awards, speeches she made, letters from camp. This is when she won the quarter mile in the county regionals. Had you prepared this envelope when you saw Ms. Kinsella? Yes. So it was two and a half years before you could hold that memorial. Two and a half years, that envelope was sitting in a drawer. I understand if she cannot tell us what that man told her. I'm an educated woman. I understand that in our system, everyone gets a defense, but because of her. You mean Miss Kinsella? Because of Eileen, there is two and a half years before we can recover Julie and take her away from the elements and the animals and anything that could have happened to her body just laying out there in that mine shaft. Was the body covered with anything? No. Or protected in any way? No. Was her body in fact intact? I don't know. Willem wouldn't tell me. You'd have to ask him. We will. Do you know if she was sexually assaulted? I don't know. Was Mr. Shodden ever charged with a se sexual attack against her? I don't know. I don't think they could have proved anything unless he'd admit it. How would you feel if you had learned that he did admit that in a sealed testimony? Objection. How would you feel if you knew that he had attacked her? Objection and relevant. Mrs. Vandegraaff, describe the effect of this delay caused by Ms. Kinsella's withholding of that information. Objection. Mrs. Vandegraaff. Describe the effect that the two and a half year delay in finding Julie's body had on your family. There is something that is worse than knowing the worst thing you will ever know in your life. And that is knowing that the terrible thing might be true, but not being sure whether it, it is. That unrelieved uncertainty, do you know what that is? This, 
idea we Catholics call limbo? Explain it to the committee in your own words. It's not heaven, it, it's not hell. It's not even purgatory where you're promised you'll move on after you've been punished and absolved. It's nothing. It's not here or there, up or down, dark or light. It's just nothing, just a black cloud of anxiety and doubt. And that is where we took up residence for two and a half years due to her ethical dilemma. Don't you think Ms. Kinsella has an ethical dilemma? <laughs> for her ethical dilemma. I'm sorry if I'm vulgar, but I was raised to speak the truth, unlike her. So what happened when you met Miss Kinsella and asked her about Julie? She said there was nothing to tell us. Eileen grabs Gordon's wrist, shakes her head no. I asked the committee to caution Miss Kinsella against histrionics. I beg the committee's pardon. Since Ms. Kinsella has a problem with your summary, tell the committee as best you can recall exactly what you said and exactly what you said, what she said. We asked her if there was anything she could tell us about Julie. What did she answer? Eileen is now in the witness stand, Gordon questioning her. That I couldn't tell her anything, which was the truth. What if she had asked you if you knew where Julie's body was? I could not have given her an answer at all. No was a lie, and yes would have breached the client's confidentiality. Silence would have been impl an implied yes. I thank God she didn't ask that question. Why didn't she, do you think? Who knows? There is a special providence in the fall of a sparrow. Let me read you uh, some excerpts from the opinions. Uh, first, from the state versus Kinsella. Uh, if this indictment stands, the attorney-client privilege will be effectively destroyed. No defendant will be able to freely discuss the facts of his case with his attorney. No attorney will be able to listen to the facts without being faced with the Hobson's choice of violating the law or violating his professional code of ethics. When the existence of the Van de Graaff remains became public, members of the public were shocked at the apparent callousness of these lawyers. A hue and cry went up, suggesting that the attorneys should be found guilty of obstruction of justice or becoming an accomplice after the fact. The layman's standpoint, this certainly was a logical conclusion. However, the Constitution of the United States of America guarantees that a defendant does not have to bear witness against himself. Because the discovery of the body of Julie Vandegraaff would have presented a significant link in a chain of evidence tending to establish guilt, Schaden was constitutionally exempt from any legal requirement to disclose the location of the body. His attorney was not only equally exempt, but under a positive stricture precluding such disclosure. When the defendant's Fifth Amendment rights are weighed against the requirements of a quasi-criminal health regulation, clearly the constitutional right must prevail, both on the grounds of violating a privileged communication and in the interests of justice. The indictment is dismissed. Now, uh, from Bar Association Matter, in Re Kinsella, the lawyer's failure to disclose his knowledge of the two unrelated homicides 
was not improper, assuming, as the facts given us indicate, that the information came to the lawyer during the course of her employment. Furthermore, the requirements of Canon 4 that a lawyer should preserve the confidences and secrets of a client would have been violated if such disclosure had been made. The lawyer's knowledge with respect to the location of the bodies was obtained solely from the client in confidence and in secret. Thus, her personal knowledge is a link solidly welded into the chain of privileged communications. The relationship between lawyer and client is in many respects like that between priest and penitent. Both lawyer and priest are bound by the bond of silence. There is no ethical impropriety in the lawyer's suggestion to the district attorney that he might be in a position to assist the authorities in resolving open cases in the course of plea negotiations. One can conceive of a variety of circumstances in which a disclosure might be in the client's interest. For example, the disclosure of the client's commission of prior crimes of violence might very well establish the client's need for confidential excuse me, for confinement, for medical treatment, rather than imprisonment. For these and other reasons cited below and in the notes, the complaint is dismissed. So what does that all mean? Lawyers are not cops. Lawyers protect the public by protecting the client, even if that client is criminal. It's our most basic safeguard against the possibility of a police state but sometimes it makes you the most despised person in town. Sometimes it violates your own moral code. You kept your ticket to practice and you got a nice payday for it. And I felt like hell. I felt like quitting. Actually, I did quit. I spent several months staring at the hedge that runs along the back of my property. Yeah, uh, I thought I'd find you here. Do you have an appointment? I took a chance. What can I get you? No, you have any Coke? I'm not much for soda. My nephew left some Mountain Dew, I think. I'll have whatever you're having. Some tea for the kind visiting priest. <laughs> Here's your cliche. <laughs> no, thank you. Ah, there's worse things in life than being a cliche. I should think that being completely original all the time would be quite a burden. I wouldn't know. <laughs> Besides, you're not a cliche. You're a hero. You're a hero. Hero, please. I'm a feminist. Sorry if that's a problem for your father. <laughs> oh, no. We have lots of feminists in the church. We call them nuns. <laughs> I hear your client died. <laughs> Killed, trying to escape makes it feel a bit like an empty exercise. I brought all that pain on the Van de Graaffs and the Westbergs in order to save that bastard's life, and he got himself killed by his own choice. I'll pray for his soul. That's your job. And yours too. How is Eileen? <laughs> I know I appear the shattered recluse, ready to snap at a moment's notice, but I'm fine. Really. Lonely, of course, but I'd probably be just as lonely if I were working. You think you're telling a priest something new? Father, you have something and someone to get up in the morning for every single day. Doesn't mean I want to. Just means I made a promise when I was young and reckless. Is a young priest reckless? What's more reckless than making a lifelong promise in your 20s? Now, having a purpose in life is, it's great. And it's a goddamn pain in the ass. Father. <laughs> God heard me complain before. He's not offended. As for you, you have someone to get up in the morning for, namely your clients. That's the problem with being a lawyer. Your whole life is about other people's problems. 
Oh, do tell. You're putting out everyone else's fires and giving them advice they won't take. Fascinating. <laughs> Father, what I mean is that you never get to say, here's the thing I'd like to work on, or here's a problem I'd like to solve. Here's a mark I can leave in the world. You don't think you've made a mark in the world. I was just dealing with a situation in front of me. I was not trying to lead a cause. Would you like to lead a cause? No. <laughs> I just want to do something that feels like me. Not just doing things that are about other people, other people's property, other people's parents, other people's children. None of this engendered by any choice I made. <laughs> Except the choice to be a lawyer. The very choice I am presently rethinking. I mean, would you let me pray with you? You mean, will I sit still for a lecture which you will deliver in the form of a prayer? Well, will you? Can I stop you? <laughs> in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Dearest Father, I thank you for the opportunity to visit and enjoy the company of your servant, Eileen. We want to thank you for your guidance through every portion of our spiritual journey, not just across the glorious mountaintops, but through those deserts of the spirit, which are necessary before we may emerge renewed, rekindled, restored. We ask it's in the name of Jesus. And in the power of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. <clears throat> Joseph removes a homemade cassette from his pocket. I brought you something. I, I know you prefer the old chants to our new Vatican II guitar music. Uh. <laughs> I wondered if you've heard of Hildegard Gard van Bingen. She was a nun, born in the first millennium, a free theologian, a bit of a scientist, as they understood the word at the time, and a composer. I made you a copy of some of her music. I thought you might enjoy it. Thank you. I don't know. Listen to in the car, maybe. I hope you like it. I know. I love it. Well, you take a listen, and I'll keep praying for you, and you keep praying for me. The music would continue throughout the phone calls. Eileen Kinsella? Eileen, this is Rita Nichols. This is Sister Catherine from the Sisters of the Renewal. I hope you're well. Your question was rather unusual. And I hope you didn't take anything we said about you personally. It took quite a bit of research. Doing my job. But I think I have an answer for you. I have a question for you. I don't want to do this on the answering machine. This might come as a surprise. Please call me and we can set up a time for you to come up and visit. I think you did a great job on the shot in case. You have a couple of choices about how to proceed. It almost made me mad how good you are. You may want to talk about if some sort of service would be in order. I thought she should be working for me. There certainly is no rule against one. So how about it, Eileen? Would you like to work for me? Would you like to join the prosecutor's office? It's all up to you. It's all up to you. Think about it. Give me a call. Give me a call. Uh, 
<laughs> of course, the two Emmys, both for me and for the script, are very gratifying. <laughs> but that's not the reason we made the film. I wanted to tell a story of a woman who had been suppressed and hindered at every turn by male institutions, whether it was the prosecutor's office, the bar association, or the Catholic Church and its backwards patriarchal ways. Many of those who have seen the film have remarked that they did not think that as a woman so attractive and well-dressed <laughs> could be taken seriously as a lawyer. There is an implied connection between physical beauty and the lack of mental ability. These are the kind of assumptions that our heroine battled against all her life, being discriminated against for her glamour and evident sexual allure. But as you can see from the very sensual love scenes in our story, there is no contradiction between prowess in the courtroom and in the bedroom. <laughs> our heroine was a woman completely dedicated to the constitutional principles of this case, someone who never hesitated or doubted when it came to asserting those principles, someone who never dodged or flinched despite the scorn of the narrow-minded bigots of her community. This was a person who completely rejected those small town values, who thought nothing of putting her own livelihood in jeopardy in order to serve the Fifth Amendment. Most importantly, this is a woman who learned to break free of the oppression, superstition, and violent misogyny of the Catholic Church. It was their obsession with the rituals of physical burial, which inspired the onslaught of death threats and the ostracism that drove this brave lawyer from her own town. When an institution teaches that women are not fully human, are not allowed to be priests, are to serve as mere baby-making vessels for the lust of men, even rapists or incestuous attackers, that a woman's calling, the highest calling, is to be, as they say, a handmaiden for some man, it is no wonder that it produces radicals and rebels like the woman at the center of our story. The church has clearly shown it has no place for her, and she, in turn, knows there is no place for the church in her life. Luckily, as the lies of religion continue to be exposed, we have something to believe in. That is the ideals of the Constitution, which have unfailingly brought us blessings of peace and justice. We fade out on Morgan and fade in on Eileen, seated as she was at the very beginning. So one day I was visiting the Cracker Box, that's the state supermax, and I swing by the office of the chaplain, Father James. He's just happy to see a lawyer who doesn't want anything from him. And Father James introduced me to Erna. Erna doesn't remember shaking her 18-month-old baby to death. Total blackout. She accepts that she must have done it, but she literally has no memory of it. It's 26 years ago now, and Erna has settled in, helping in the prison hospital and supporting the ministry. I represented her for the parole hearing. She lost. There's no hope for parole if you can't say you're sorry. And Erna cannot say she's sorry for her daughter's death because she has no consciousness of causing it. And she is a very serious Christian, and she won't lie, not even to get out of prison. Her other children sort of lost interest. They're not church people or prison reformers, so they've just sort of drifted away. So it's me and Father James and prisoners she knows, and that, for the moment, seems to be enough for Erna. And Erna is the kind of client that makes me glad to be a lawyer. We haven't had a big win but she is a good person. She did something terrible, and she may even have done it for bad reasons. I suspect there were drugs involved, but we don't talk about that. She's not wicked. She's just someone who made terrible choices. And that's who I feel called to speak for, not the innocent person who's the victim of injustice, but the guilty person who has received justice and needs help working through that the best they can. I do it not because it makes me happy, although it does, but because I am called to do it. 
I make this choice because I have no choice. I'm sure you figured out I didn't become a prosecutor, although it was flattering to get that call from Rita Nichols. But I already had a call, a vocation to advocate. That's what they call what we do in most places in the world, advocate, one who speaks for others. How often has that made all the difference? Right now, I want you to stop and think of those who have spoken for you and how that advocacy helped you. Shh. Picture them if it helps. So, this degree you want to give me? Unearned. It feels a little like the Wizard of Oz giving the Tin Woodman a testimonial so he can prove to everyone he's a good person. I don't care one way or the other about her receiving a degree. What does that matter to me? None of what we do here will affect my clients. What she did, she did. And nothing will change that. Are you going to quote me in the newspaper? I don't want her to sue me. I don't regret that I couldn't help Lisa Westberg or Julie Vandegraaff. That wasn't my fault. I, I don't say anything about her being the lawyer for the killer. That's how the system is. People have to have lawyers. But I was forced to hurt some kind and decent people who were already hurting very badly. But she has no idea what she did to us. I think about the parents all the time. She looked us right in the face and told us she had nothing to tell us. It was practically a lie, and it was as if she didn't have a care in the world. I couldn't even really explain. She didn't even try to explain. To even try to explain would have broken the client's confidence. Makes you think. Lawyers don't even understand how people feel. It nearly broke me. It still hurts. The worst thing is that she left her. I left her. She left Julie lying there alone. I, I left Julie lying there alone. In the cold. In the cold. In the dark. In the dark. No one who loved her near. No one who loved her near. No one to say goodbye. We never said goodbye. There was nothing I could do. And yet I was wrong. Terribly wrong. That's why you can't give me the prize. We are on a hillside, sloping down to a river. It is windy as in early spring. Eileen is holding flowers. It's right about here. It's impossible to be precise after all these years. How can you be sure this is it? Old visitors maps of the convent. They called it the, gar the Garden of Eternal Hope. Oh yes, I, I remember hearing that. Uh, they weren't differentiated or marked but your daughter... Elizabeth. Elizabeth. She was interred by herself. It's not a common grave. Oh, there's worse ways to spend eternity than to be jumbled up with our fellow human beings. Maybe the children here would be playmates. Better than being alone. We are never alone. It feels that way a lot on this earth. Yes, it does. I'll leave you alone. Hello, Lily Pitt. It's nice to see you're in such a pretty place. I've missed you all these years. I don't even know what you looked like. I made a picture in my head, but I'm sorry I couldn't bring you into this world. There are so many lovely things here. So much we could have shared. 
I just hope you know you were loved, are loved, and remembered. Sister Catherine, where shall I lay these? Sister Catherine lays the flowers against a small stone cross. It's a beautiful view of the lake from here. Beautiful. Lights fade. End of play. Oh. Actors, would you please return? Oh. Playwright, would you please join us? There you are. <laughs> oh. Wonderful. Thank you for your support of the arts. ATC Studios is a 501c3, and your tax-deductible donations are always gratefully accepted. You may make a donation through our website right on the homepage at www.atcstudios.org or by Venmo at ATC Studios. Thank you for joining us.